On today's show, I'm joined by Laurie Nickel from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel. Uh, she wrote a fantastic story, a couple of stories actually, on Giannis, uh, some mental health stuff, which we know is very prominent with athletes right across the world right now, and also a little more uh, info on the foundation that he and the family have launched in the name of his father, Charles. So there is a great chat to come here with Laurie. It was a fantastic pair of stories. We're going to break it all down and give the context that I think people need uh, after maybe just seeing some of the headlines. So let's get into it. You are Locked On Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are locked on Bucks. My name's Kane Pittman. You can see and hear me on this show Monday to Friday and also find my work over at ESPN. And as I mentioned right off the top, I'm joined from the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel, one of, uh, look, I'm a little biased, I'm going to be honest, but the best sports writer in the state of Wisconsin, no doubt about it, and a good friend of mine, Laurie Nickel, who, if you're watching on YouTube, by the way, can't see Laurie right now. There's some connection issues going on, but this conversation is far too important to not press ahead with it here. So if you're watching on YouTube, terrible news for you because you just got to look at my head for this entire podcast. But if you're on the audio platform, you won't know what I'm talking about. So we're going to bring Laurie in in just a second. But today's episode is brought to you by uh, eBay Motors, a championship team it is about each player being a perfect fit. Same with your vehicle. So for parts that fit, head to eBay Motors and look for the green check Stay in the game with eBay Guaranteed Fit, ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. As always, we thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first watch or first listen of every single weekday. And during the postseason, we're going to have weekend pods as well. So the only way to keep up to date with everything is subscribe, drop a like, drop a comment, rate and review and all those things. It helps us grow the show. It's free to do so. And it's the best way for you guys to get involved and tell us what you don't like about the show, what you do like, and straight up just debate me because I'm in the comments every single day. So it's a lot of fun. We appreciate all the support we get. And just quickly, Chicago beat Toronto. So it means that the Bucks in the first round are either going to play Miami or Chicago. So we'll wait and see how that final play-in uh, game uh, comes over the weekend, uh, Friday night, I believe it is, over there in the US. But we do have to get to... The main conversation point of our podcast today. So, as I mentioned, Laurie is with me. Laurie, you have written a couple of stories that have dead set taken over the internet over the last 24 hours. You know, I really appreciate you talk, letting me talk about this too, because some of the aggregate stuff that I'm seeing out there is really frustrating. But, you know, anything with Giannis Antetokounmpo seems to take off. He is really <laughs> beloved, not just in Wisconsin, but internationally. I'm hearing from fans in Greece, of course, but also France and all over the world. So um, Brazil, Mexico. So it's been kind of cool. So the first thing I'll say that you should do, because as you pointed to, there's a lot of aggregation out there and there's some dramatic quotes and dramatic headlines that are all over the internet right now. So what you should actually really do, if maybe you can pause this podcast and go read the stuff first, and then you can get the context from Laurie or at the bare minimum, once we're done with this chat, go and check out the stories in the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel well, certainly on Laurie's Twitter, you'll see the links to those stories there at Laurie Nickel on Twitter. You should be following Laurie anyway. Uh, but go read the stories because you'll get the, the background there. So if we start, and there's two separate stories here, we're going to get to the foundation in the name of Charles Adetokounmpo at the back end because I think that that's a really important discussion to have. But if we start with the mental health element of this with Giannis and his growth from a rookie where he, he's coming into the league and the expectations probably aren't that he's going to be the best basketball player in the world to where he is in 2020. I'm going to just read, Laurie, and this I'm not sure if this will upset you, but I'm just going to bring up a <laughs> quote from the story because this is what's making headlines and then you can provide the context that is needed for, for what this all means and how we got here and then how, obviously, the Bucks progress through this. So if I pull it up in the screen, this is what everyone is talking about. Yana says uh, to Laurie, in 2020, I was ready to walk away from the game. I had that conversation uh, with the front office. And, you know, very normally, everybody is looking at me like I was crazy. You just signed the largest contract in NBA history and you want to walk away from the game and all that money. Uh, man, you can take that money and shove it into your... And then uh, a few dots there, but we get what he was uh, getting at. So right. it's important to note when this was. The pandemic's in full swing. Right. The Bucks went to the bubble. That was obviously a very challenging time. And they failed from a basketball standpoint on the court. They failed. They were eliminated in the second round despite having the number one record in the NBA. So 
what, what was the context for those quotes and, and what Giannis was discussing, uh, what he was going through at the time? Thank you so much for giving me a chance to explain and for all those nice things that you said. Um, okay, so Giannis and his family launched their family foundation, their charitable foundation a couple of months ago. And I approached him after a game maybe two weeks ago and just said, hey, can we talk about this? I don't know, you know, most people know that he made the appearance on The Daily Show. And so I figured, okay, they're ready to talk about it. So Giannis agreed to talk to me and, um, this is at, you know, 11 o'clock at night after a game at Pfizer Forum. In fact, it was the one where he was perfect from the field and he had the game ball and all that kind of stuff. And I have noticed from covering Giannis, from meeting him when he was an 18-year-old until now, he's been really quotable in the last couple of years, the last two or three years. And, you know, like that quote where he said, you know, I'm trying to be humble and I'm trying to be thoughtful and and not selfish and all that kind of stuff. And I every time I'm like, man, he's talking to somebody. He's talking to a shrink, a therapist or somebody, but I've never had a chance to ask him about it. So we sit down and we finally have a chance to talk about his foundation. And I said, it's incredible. You are covering so much ground with this foundation. You aren't start starting with one mission, you know, like the Milwaukee diaper mission. And you're not starting with one country like Greece. They're covering like so many humanitarian causes in three different countries. And I'm like, this is classic Giannis. You know, you're <laughs> you're going to do everything big. You know, I think too small. You're going to think big. And he said, yeah, but I'll tell you, mental health is really big for me. And I kind of like just casually said to him, you know, are you talking to somebody? Are you talking to a sports psychologist? And that's when he paused. And you could kind of tell, like, that's a pretty personal question. Sure. Uh, for some people, especially, and certainly for athletes and certainly for superhuman athletes like Giannis, you know, and he paused and then all of a sudden he just talks and tells me stuff that I had never heard before, like the fact that even though he carries himself a certain way and, and you and I know him as this happy joyful, joking guy. He would always joke it with you at press conferences and stuff. He's probably one of the happiest, friendliest players that you and I have covered. But privately, he was struggling and he was frustrated and he felt a lot of pressure, pressure to be the best player in the country, pressure to win a championship, pressure to sign a contract, you know, the Supermax and stay. All this stuff was mounting. And that's where he dropped that quote that you began the show with was he just felt miserable and he didn't like that he was withdrawing himself personally from people, which we know he did in the bubble. We didn't know how much he felt that way. And then he felt this kind of strange divide between his job and wanting to go to work and doing the thing he loves and not getting to be around his family. And again, it's such a unique situation there. I've covered a lot of athletes with brothers. Brett Favre had brothers. Um, Aaron Rodgers had brothers. Lots of, you know, the Holiday brothers, all those. But there's something about the Antetokounmpo brothers that there's a bond there that is forever is, you know, that's the ride and die. And that's from now until forever. That's their legacy. And for some reason, Giannis felt so much pressure to be somebody else um, in the NBA that he contemplated quitting to the point where he's like, I just, I can't manage this anymore. And the further backstory behind that is, is he really didn't buy into the need to address mental health. Funny mm -hmm. enough, you know, in 2017 and in 2018, when a couple of other famous players in the NBA talked about mental health issues, which was really great that they did that. We've heard of some of that in other sports, but this was groundbreaking in the NBA. Giannis kind of did the, you know, what? Come on, just play ball, you know, be <laughs> tough, get through it, fight through it, which is totally the athlete mantra. That is how athletes think. If they don't think that way, they don't play. And if they don't play, they don't eat, you know, they don't make money or whatever. So, and especially given Giannis's story, backstory, which you all know well, and your audience knows well, he had to fight his whole life from childhood to getting here, to acclimating to the States, to all that stuff. He's been in this fight or flight mode basically since childhood. 
And so he really didn't even allow himself to think about these kind of conflicting feelings of how come I love this game and I hate this game right now. And he, I'm, those are my words. Those aren't his words. Mm -hmm. All of his words are in the story. I quoted him pretty much everything he told me. And he kind of came to this conclusion, like, wow, something's not right. This doesn't feel normal. It's not normal for everybody to kind of make me out to be the greatest in the world, the greatest player and put all this pressure on me. And then Giannis was like, maybe I need to talk to a therapist. And that opens up the whole story of why this is part of the foundation, this cause that's going on in Milwaukee, and one of the many elements that they are covering with this incredible foundation, which isn't even a year old. So I love it. And, and I don't want to give away the entire story because ultimately the point of this show is we want people to go and read the full story for themselves. But we want to give little parts away from what I took away from it. I want to ask you next about what changes you've seen. So let's take away what we know now, uh, but what changes you've seen over the last couple of years with Giannis since I left Milwaukee because I've discussed it on this podcast that I think I've seen changes with the way he presents himself and always wondered uh, you know, what was real and, and what uh, drove him to sort of be that way. So I'm curious to see how you mm -hmm. feel about it. So we're going to get to that next after I talk about eBay Motors for a championship team. It's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. And we know Laurie is uh, a big uh, car person, always working on the cars. Every part needs to fit just right. So the next time you need parts and accessories, head to eBay Motors with eBay Guaranteed Fit. You can be sure every part uh, it fits right and first time around. So just add your ride to my garage. Look for the green check to know if the part will fit or you'll get your money back. Because just like in sports, confidence is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you'll be back in the game in no time. After all, it's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit, and the right prices on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride eligible items. Only exclusions apply. If we keep talking about the, the mental side of this and obviously stuff that we didn't know about. And, you know, a lot of it, as you know, Laurie, and this is why I respect you so much, is because I think that you do uh, cover the sports from uh, from the right angle. And we saw recently that Tanasa had some time away from the team. And I was surprised that on this podcast, I came out and said, I don't really care why Tanasa is away from the team. Hopefully he's fine, but I don't need to, an answer. If he's away for personal reasons, I don't need to know. And there was a few people that commented on the show and they said, hey, thanks for not caring. And it was surprising to me because I've never wanted to do this job from the angle of needing to know everything. So I'm glad that Giannis has been able to do things that has helped him because I think that's the most important thing, regardless of what he does on the court. He's, he's under a lot of pressure. And I think the way the game is covered has gotten a little bit nasty in terms of if you aren't winning, then you're a complete failure. And if you're not winning these MVPs, then you're no good. And if Giannis doesn't win a title this year, then uh, it hurts his legacy. Like, I hate all that. I enjoy watching him play because he's one of an all-time great. But I do think that in 2021, when the Bucs won the title and beyond, whether it's just in the press conferences or it's something he's been working on, it feels like it has changed a little bit with the way that he's been able to uh, articulate bad moments, losses, and look at things from the big picture. And maybe this is a part of everything that he discussed with you. Well, think about it. I mean, first of all, playing professional sports is unhealthy. Okay. Let's just be <laughs> honest. The schedule is unhealthy. It's not conducive to family life or personal life. Um, it's hell on your body. You know, it, they, it takes a toll uh, physically, you know, um, they haven't invented new cartilage yet for the knees. So you're just going to kill yourself for all these games and all this stuff. So they're already drained. And then like, imagine going to your job and then having 20,000 people count to 14 while you try to get, you know, your deadline or whatever, like the stuff that Giannis faced just with the free throw stuff was insane. And he held it all together and he worked so hard on his temper Remember when he was a young player, he would get kind of fiery and, you know, not like he was a street fighter or something, but he certainly that he's not going to back down from anybody. He doesn't need to, doesn't want to, but he had to work on that self-control and containing his energy and channeling it in a positive way. And then, you know, there's other elements that affected him, I think, as well. If, if you remember him accepting his first MVP speech, 
um, or that speech and how he broke down talking about his beloved father who passed away. Um, that's, that's, the, that's a traumatic event for this family. He was the patriarch of this family. He was the leader. He, and you know, he means so much to those, the, the brothers. So these are just like normal things, not to mention all the pressure and the stress that there is to win in this league, all the weird um, content that's out there now, all the strange speculation, all this weird, like, you know, I have a right to know everything and you should play when you don't feel well and play, you know, for championships. And by the way, it's your job, athlete one, two, and three, to entertain me and distract me from my miserable life. Like I just, everything about it is kind of strange. So Giannis, by talking to this therapist, I now realize that's where he said the quote of, you know, that's, that's humility, or that's my ego talking, or that's the past talking. That's what kicked it off a lot. And I think that was the 21 um, season where mm. they came back and, and were playing, you know, in that shortened season. And that was a really challenging year. They began the, you know, with eight games at home and nobody in the stands and all this stuff. So he started to reveal um, what he was working on personally, which is what can he control? And he can control how he conducts himself, how he prepares, um, how he divides up his time, you know, rests and gets ready. You know, Brooke Lopez talked him into buying that hyperbaric chamber, you know, or, or vice versa. Like they both talked about it and they both got it. So that's a huge investment. And as Giannis started talking about this, he really was okay. You know, six game losing streak. Well, we got, what can we learn from it? Instead of popping off about things that surely he was, might be frustrated with, whether it's teammates or strategies or defenses or the referees or whatever, he was always trying to focus it positively. And that takes a lot of emotional maturity and leadership really to be willing to do that. Other things that I've seen from Giannis, you know, if something bad is going on, like a, a losing streak or, you know, people are criticized, you know, they lost like three games in six weeks or something. He'll come down and talk to the press. And yeah. that's a leadership thing too. A lot of people don't, you know, sometimes you just have to answer for the team and not have other people answer for you. Um, but also the big change that I see with him, it's kind of a personal note, but his kids are around him and that's unique. Um, there's not other players, kids in that locker room after the game. And that's, I, I don't know what the arrangement is there, but it's his kids are with him at the press conference. They're with him in the locker room. They're around him. It's important that they, to him, obviously, and to the family that they spend as much time together as possible. And they, I have covered a few athletes in my lifetime where that makes a big difference to, to, to a player. And if they're willing to go all in on their job and get their treatment done properly, you know, he takes forever post game with his <laughs> treatment and ice down and all that. It's easier to commit to that when you feel like you have the support and you have your family and all that. So the, I've seen verbal changes, leadership changes, family dynamic changes, and yet he still, you know, seems to have the respect of all the guys in the locker room which sets the tempo for how that locker room personality is. And he's the oldest 28 year old I've ever met. You know, he's like an old soul and he's gone through this in the very public eye. I remember a few years back, you said that we used to always joke around. I was before a game and he was doing something. And I remember at the time I was, you know, 28 or whatever. And he was, you know, 24, 25. And I remember saying that to him, I'm like, how is it actually physically possible that you are this much younger than me? And yet you are a, a already far more mature than I'll probably ever be in my whole life. But he, <laughs> look, you know, um, from on the basketball court, look, uh, I love him. I, I continue to think he's one of the more remarkable athletes that I've ever seen anyway. And certainly uh, my career is pretty short, but certainly the most remarkable athlete I've ever uh, been around um, mm -hmm. for all the reasons that you just mentioned there. So I, I think it's, it's an incredible story. It's an incredible insight that you were able to get and you get it all the time, Laurie, not just with Giannis, but with, with athletes all over Wisconsin. So it was a great story. I, I before we uh, move on, I do want to come back and talk a little bit more about the foundation though, because I think that that's 
important to spread the word a little bit about that. And maybe some of our listeners or viewers aren't too familiar uh, with that aspect and certainly that part of your story. So I want to come back to that in just a little bit. But FanDuel uh, is the sponsor of the podcast. Grand Slams, no hitters and double plays are back. And there's no better place to get in on the MLB action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. That's because right now, new customers can step up to the plate with a no-sweat first bet up to 1000 bucks. Just go to fanduel.com slash locked on, sign up, place your first bet, and get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if you don't win. So let's check the FanDuel odds. The NL Central, Laurie. Milwaukee Brewers, plenty of our listeners and viewers, big Brewers fans, they're the favorite to win the division at minus 135. St. Louis there, Chicago, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati. So the Cubs at plus 1,300. So we hope they obviously don't uh, win the division. We're, we're obviously hoping the Brewers can get it here. But I am a little surprised that they're the favorites because uh, judging by my Twitter feed, I thought Brewers fans were a little disgruntled enter- entering this season. But anyway, don't miss your chance to get a no-sweat first bet up to 1000 bucks when you join FanDuel today. Just go to fanduel.com slash locked on to sign up. That's FanDuel, official partner of Major League Baseball. All right, the Charles Adetokumbo Family Foundation, Laurie. Uh, we've seen a little bit about this on Twitter. Certainly your story was, in my opinion, the most detailed. I'd actually read about it to learn a little bit more about this. So what is the the background and obviously the the idea of this foundation and what Giannis and the family are trying to do in the name of, of Charles, who you mentioned obviously was uh, incredibly important to the whole family? This is unique. I've done a lot of these stories too, and I really like and appreciate what the Antetokounmpo's are doing. Um, there's set, all the brothers are involved. Um, Mrs. Antetokounmpo, Veronica is involved. And what they did is about a year, well, really in after Charles passing in 2017, they've been thinking about this and talking about it. And then about a year and a half ago, they sat down as a family and one by one, every member of the family said, what they wanted, what group, what demographic they wanted to help. Veronica wanted to help widows, you know, Alex and Kostas wanted to help youth basketball players, especially in Greece, um, especially kids who maybe can't afford some of the programs and the high level coaching. So they they started um, that team out there, which is a hundred kids strong. And then Giannis and Thanasis were like-minded. They, they both really wanted to support mental health. They wanted to work with, you know, Mariah, um, Giannis's partner. They do the Milwaukee diaper mission here and they they're doing the mental health thing here in, in Milwaukee, which is through antidote health. That's also in the story where they're offering free health care through the end of the month. And the foundation is paying with a grant, a million dollars for that kind of thing. So they, they have bigger dreams beyond this. This isn't something that's going to, we're only going to talk about for one or two years. This is something that they want to be around for generations to come. Something that like what LeBron has done or what Oprah Winfrey has done, where they open up, you know, centers that would support working moms and, and help people in crisis, you know, help them get through the emergency that they're facing, whether they're refugees or whether they're dealing with extreme poverty. And then also, you know, helping people thrive to get to the next level where they can be trained for jobs or education. And Giannis and Thanasis really had like this big picture dream. They've already started some of this. They raised one and a half million dollars with their event in New York at the end of February. Um, And then they also had a silent auction or some kind of auction that supported the earthquake victims in Turkey Mm -hmm. and Syria. So, you know, this thing started, it basically was launched, you know, like late June of last year, and it's already donated to several causes and is just now, you know, getting off the ground in terms of visibility. And this is something that Giannis's eyes light up talking about it. Like this is something this, they really believe this is going to be their legacy more, maybe as much or more than their basketball contributions. And that's how they are. I mean, they were, you know, Thanasis was really concerned. There was a horrible train accident in Greece and he was following that and really concerned about all the students who were affected. They are worldly people. They follow things. They're well-traveled. They care a lot. And the whole basis of this is that their father and their mom 
did so much for the family to seek a better life, to move to Greece, to do what they could. And then other people helped the family um, get through tough times. And now the Antetokounmpo's believe that it's their responsibility to help others. And I don't know how you feel about this, but I don't hear a lot of, about that here in the States where it's like, okay, I'm doing well now. I've got a good job. Things are, you know, I'm not worried about my next meal. Um, and now I need to help other people. It's my job. It's my responsibility. And again, the Nassus and, and Giannis were like, hey, we're not saying other, what other people need to do. We're not like trying to lecture anybody. We're not trying to virtual, you know, virtue signal anything, but they feel that they, it's their obligation to help other people, to give them a hand up. And I, that is within their nature, but I, I didn't know that about them. Maybe the first eight years of Giannis's career, you know, he was all so businesslike, just really focused as you know, and as all his fans know. So this is a broader scope and they want to honor Charles and Veronica with the name, you know, they should, they really probably should have called it the Antetokounmpo Foundation just for that brand name recognition. But um, Giannis fought really hard for that in team meetings and stuff like that and said, Hey, no, we're going to name it after my parents. And, and this is going to be around a hundred years from now. And the other component that I hope I, I would like to explain is that a lot of athletes start foundations on their own and they're either run by a family friend or a family member or something like that, or somebody who volunteers. And USA Today had a special segment probably two months ago about how inefficient some of that stuff is. And that, you know, they might raise like, just for an example, a hundred dollars, but only $60 goes out to charity. Like the rest hmm. is, you know, it's not an efficient way. And I have personally covered fraudulent agents and people who have taken money um, and gone to jail and said it was, you know, for charity, but they were pocketing themselves. So I'm all like my first question to Foundation X, which is helping the CAF Foundation run. My first thing was, OK, how much money is going straight to charity? You know, what are you guys doing about this? And that's what's different. The um, Antetokounmpo Foundation hired a specific person with corporate grant um, giving experience, 15 years. Her name is Emily Vennerstrom, and she's with Foundation X, and she runs everything. And that means that anybody who's donating to any of these causes with the foundation can pretty much count on, you know, 97 cents on the dollar or something mm -hmm. like that goes to the charity. And it's, you know, they have very low overhead. They have very low administrative fees. Um, the grant money that's raised goes directly into the charity. And that was really important for me as, as again, a cynical reporter who's covered a lot of this <laughs> because um, donations, at least in the United States, um, more than 80%, almost 90% is individual donors. I always thought it was corporations, big corporations, big, you know, foundations, that really ran a lot of the, the, the driving force. It's not, it's people like you, it's people like me who give 25 bucks here, 50 bucks there, hundred dollars there. And I care a lot about that. If people are gonna you know, spend their hard earned money towards a charity, you want to know that it's gonna go help people. And the Antetokounmpo's felt the same way. And that's why they hired Foundation X to run all of this, to make it honest to make it transparent um and that was a big sign for me like a big trustworthy type of thing and also finally i don't know if you know this if you've ever done this but i there were times i would always write stories about athletes oh they made a charity appearance oh that's so nice of them and later i found out that the athletes were getting paid for these <laughs> charity appearances so people would raise money and then the the fundraiser would have to pay the athlete to make the appearance. And I thought that was disgusting. <laughs> I was judgy there. So then some athletes waive their appearance fee. Um, they might do an, you know, something at a golf outing or a, a dinner or something. And instead of charging a fee for their appearance, um, they would waive that. The Antetokounmpo's are putting in their own money. And I, again, <laughs> I hate, I mean, 
that's why I got so angry when I saw some of the crap on Twitter and social media and all these people cherry picking the one quote or whatever and ripping Giannis and some ridiculous comments about how he's lying and all this other BS. The man opened up about all of this because he wants to help people. And he's literally spending his own money to get this off the ground. Like he would rather not ask for so many donations or whatever. They'll take it, of course, but he will invest his own. And that you can say whatever you want about how rich these guys are or whatever. They still pay, you know, after 50% taxes, <laughs> they, you know, money is still something that's personal. We don't, and I have never had an athlete tell me in the NBA, I'm going to pony up myself. And of course, everybody in my family is. And I asked him that question and he looked at me like, are you crazy? Of course I'm going <laughs> to. So that again is a big thing to me that, that's another trait about him and the family that I think is very likable and very relatable for somebody who's a superstar like that and has kind of lived in this other world right now. Um, he's still grounded and still gets it. And those are some pretty cool points that I learned. And this is just, these are just introductory stories, the, the mental health one, and then the foundation. I mean, we hope to do a lot more. Um, it was just an introduction, but I was kind of impressed all the way around with that. I don't know if you've dealt with that and like what stuff you've covered, but for me, who's done this a long time, it was unique. No, it's beautifully said. And even though if you think we've seen enough examples over the years of this entire family and uh, their nature, maybe you you sit back and you say, okay, I, I can believe that, um, but it's extraordinary. You mentioned the first eight years of his career. And because we know the background, it was about, okay, I need to look after my own family We've been through what we've been through. And then as soon as he earned the money, he's like, all right, now it's time to start helping everyone else. And as you pointed to, that is just, that's that's not that's not the norm. That is not the way these things usually go. So a remarkable family. And uh, I, I agree. Well, I think you said it was their point, but it wouldn't surprise anyone, I think, if, if these, uh, Giannis and Thanasis and the rest of the family end up uh, making a bigger impact off the floor, which is pretty ridiculous considering what he does uh, for the Milwaukee Bucks on the court. Better wrap this up, but first I will tell everyone to listen to the Locked On Game to Game podcast as well. The playing tournament's on. The postseason starts on the weekend. Game one for the Bucks on Sunday, uh, 5.30 or 4.30 Central Time, I believe it is. So uh, the Locked On Game to Game podcast has stats, news, info, analysis from all the Locked On hosts around the network. So check out Locked On Game to Game on your Locked On NBA feed. Laurie, yeah. you're a star. And no. And uh, no, can I, I, can I interrupt you? actually, I want to interrupt you. This is very you know, rude. This is this is my I'm show, sorry, Larry, and, and you just come on here. You I'm come missing. on here. Second I'm time sorry. you've been on here, and now you start to interrupt. But continue, continue. Okay. The other thing <laughs> that I get sensitive about is, okay, Giannis opened up. Like this doesn't happen if he doesn't want to talk about it. That's right. And I have I have been pursuing stories. I pursued. Um, the Kyrie Irving thing back in the fall. And I talked to, I interviewed a bunch of people and I was like, I'm ready to talk about, you know, what he said that was racist or whatever. And the, and players are like, you know what? I really don't want to. So that story died. That got killed. I have pursued other stories where it's like, this is an incredible personal story about this athlete and his background and everything. And it gets declined because maybe somebody in the family doesn't want to do it or doesn't. It, I can't do this if Giannis doesn't agree to talk about it, which is also pretty remarkable given that is, you know, he's got his own platforms. He doesn't need this. He's got a young family. He doesn't need this stress or this extra attention or whatever. So this is all because a, an athlete cared about his cause so much and his foundation and was willing to talk about it. And as reporters, we're only as good as our sources and I'm so thankful that he was willing to do that because otherwise this is just, this would have just been a generic, you know, yeah, they're giving money here. Yeah. They're giving money there. And, and we've all read that a hundred times. It was not personal, but because he talked about it, it made it special. So that's just what I wanted to, you know, it's all him. Well, yes. Yeah. Your overall point, I can't, I, I can't dispute, but you're still, uh, great at your job, and uh, and that's why mm -hmm. you you were able to get these type of stories. And the one last point I'd make to you, Laurie, is don't worry about the comment section on uh, social media. There's nothing we can ever do to change that. Just, but, but, you got to push but, forward. I know, but when somebody talks about <laughs> mental health, 
I, know I, do, I do normally ignore it. I love the mute button. But when you <laughs> when you attack a guy for and and call him a liar and all this other stuff, and you're anonymous and you've got you know, I, I can't, I just, that is, that, that's a really personal thing for me. And I think it's disgusting. And I, there's some things I will call out, like whatever that stupid site was that I called out on Twitter, that's got a million followers. No, I'm not putting up with that crap anymore. And, you know, you and I have to fight that all the time. We have to go in there in the locker room and that get these guys to trust us, to open up, to tell us whether it's the play that they're trying to run or how they feel about the coaching staff or the weird ownership group that could be coming in with the changes with the bucks or whatever it is, how can I get a guy to trust me to be fair and honorable and at least accurate when all this other stuff takes off on social media and it tries to discredit, you know, I re, you know, hours of reporting and writing and all that stuff. So there's going to be times where I'm going to argue with the comments section and <laughs> and maybe someday I'll just get fired for what I say. I don't know. It'll be worth it. But someday you got to fight sometimes. So this was my day. I like it. And uh, that's why I continue to learn off you, Laurie. And I say that in all seriousness, you play it down, but um, you're great at your job. I appreciate your time tonight. Mm -hmm. And it's great to catch up. Hopefully I'll see you in person very soon. It'll be great. We really miss you. So come back home. <laughs> all right. Another podcast tomorrow. And I believe I'm dragging on another good friend of mine, Eric Name from The Athletic. So uh, we now really need to shift our attention to the postseason. So Eric's going to come on tomorrow. We'll talk all things Bucks and uh, the postseason, even though we won't know the opponent yet. So make sure you join in the show tomorrow. Subscribe, drop a like, comment, all those things. We appreciate it. Helps the show grow. We'll catch you all tomorrow.